The facts in Ukraine are a tragedy of our times, but from the point of view of the military technology and the art of war, it is a stalemate. And I think we should ask ourselves, how do we break the stalemate? Let's go! So some time ago I made a video saying that the war was going to end soon because the stalemate was going to push the two sides to the negotiating table. While I was unfortunately and tragically wrong, there are some calls for negotiations, uh, for finding a compromise, but these are, yeah, from the West, from third parties, we don't know if the two adversaries will heed this suggestion, unfortunately. And for all those who say that finding a compromise now will shatter all the principles of international law, well, I answer that it's probably better shattering those than countless lives. But beyond that, the problem becomes how do we break the stalemate? And to do so, we need to understand why there is a stalemate in the first place. Well, uh, Ukraine is now one of the main markets for commercial and civilian drones. And drones are indeed the protagonist of this war. The Russians now have entire drone battalions. This is a new form of portable air power that is making all the difference. Well, not all the difference, but a lot of difference, yes. And the Russians actually are producing drones on a scale that never happened in Russia. They had a pretty robust production and adoption of drones, but now it has uh, really uh, exploded. <laughs> But commercial drones are not everything. I mean, it's not a secret that Ukraine is actually cooperating with NATO and there is a large amount of intelligence being provided to Ukraine derived from NATO assets, which are mostly airborne assets that are flying. And it's not a mystery that the Russians are operating their assets too. I mean, the Russians are fewer, but indeed they have an important capability in this area. And if you up the game one notch, obviously there are all the space-based assets. Neither side is short of reconnaissance satellites. So what's the point I'm trying to make? The point is that both sides have plenty of intelligence. The point is the battlefield is now transparent. Everyone is seeing what everyone else is doing. And this has a pretty obvious consequence. The consequence is that tactical surprise is now impossible. Operational surprise is very, very difficult. And even strategic surprise is not what it used to be. Well, I think I don't have to explain why surprise is the main force multiplier. Tactical surprise was something that normally in most situations a competent commander could achieve. Operational surprise has always been more difficult because it's well, a larger scale is requires a coordination uh, that is more difficult but was still achievable every time every time both sides try to concentrate their forces to overwhelm the enemy they have been hit so hard that the offense is stalled it happened to the ukrainian at the beginning of the summer offensive it happened to the russian and at Avdivka. but there are many other examples in this war if everybody knows what's happening and can see everybody else then surprise doesn't exist everybody can react to the opponent moves in time and with modern weapons the firepower is such that pretty much any concentration of forces get hammered down and destroyed before it could do pretty much anything either concentrated firepower or precision firepower are so devastating that the only way is avoiding them and if the opponent knows what's going on you simply can't 
So obviously the next question is, how do we break the stalemate? So I recently had the opportunity to have a conversation with a retired Italian general from the army who said that the solution is probably either in the very small or the very large. What did he mean with that? So the idea was that you either see what we're seeing now, small operations, scale that is maximum a company, occasionally too, but that's, that's occasional, and that's too small to be really targeted heavily by the precision fire or the suppression fire, typical of the Russians, and uh, being destroyed before the operation starts. Actually, we had the witness of a Russian regiment commander who said that five to ten men is the size, because anything bigger is going to be targeted and destroyed. Rats, right, it's raining again. <laughs> The footage where M7 explains the large part got lost because of his absent due to his advancing age. Okay, day two. Let's see if we can finish this thing off. If intelligence is the problem maybe just maybe my speculation you should start by trying to suppress intelligence so when it comes to suppress let's say drones and let's say rather low end drones there is a flurry of activity all around the world uh, in incredibly long video if uh, we had to browse through all the solutions that are being proposed but what seems to work today is mostly a mix of electronic warfare and small caliber anti-aircraft guns yeah but here we have a fundamental assimilation that we have very cheap weapons, I mean the drones, and very uh, expensive countermeasures, or better countermeasures that tend to be more expensive than the drones, more or less, at least for now. I personally believe that the final solution would be laser weapons, but as we are used to say, laser weapons are the weapons of the future, and they will always be. Then there is a higher level, which is all those systems that can collect electromagnetic radiation of any kind, or they are actually active in the electromagnetic spectrum, which I mean radars, obviously. There are ground radars, there are aircraft that can create pictures of the ground that are very useful to identify the, the opponent's vehicles, the opponent forces on the ground, but also there are electronic warfare systems that can either collect intelligence or simply jam the communications, basically mostly that, the communications of the opponent. These systems are in themselves expensive, but the round is not expensive. I mean, the electrical power is not really expensive, doesn't require sophisticated resources to create. So they are a pretty good solution for this mid-tier of intelligence. So how would you suppress them? Well, with other electronic warfare or by direct attack but the intelligence to actually execute a direct attack is still coming from electronic support measures and then there are all the very high-end assets like the EC-135 I mean the big reconnaissance aircraft and the big reconnaissance assets and uh, the game of cat and mouse of that well it's classic it's something that we already know and uh, uh, it's something that the great powers have played for decades now so in that area there's not going to be a particular push like there's going to be for the lower ends and finally finally there are space-based assets satellites both sides have plenty of those 
and this is the most disquieting scenario because the most obvious way of disrupting the intelligence collected by this system is actually shooting them down. Hitting a satellite doesn't require that top technology tier. All the main powers are capable of doing. And I'm pretty sure that if a developed countries want to acquire uh, uh, anti-space capability, well, they can do relatively easily. What's the problem here? Well, have you ever heard about the Kessler syndrome? So the Kessler syndrome is not a medical condition, is an hypothetic scenario in which Space powers start fighting each other, start destroying the satellites, and every destroyed satellite is going to generate a cloud of debris that in orbit are going to become shrapnels that may destroy other satellites, even those which are not involved in the confrontation. And this is going to create a chain reaction that is going to hit more or less all the satellites in the same orbit and make access to space extremely difficult because in that situation the amount of debris that is created may increase very very quickly and uh, an entire layer around the heart is probably too dangerous for uh, a satellite or spacecraft now think what may happen if someone started to attack those big mega constellations like starlink that would probably deny access to space for decades. I mean, the debris stays in orbit for a long time. The higher their orbit, the longer it stays. They tend to decay after some time, but it may take years and years and even decades, in some cases even centuries, before they fall down on Earth. That is a very, very disquieting hypothesis. I have to say that the United States, but also other uh, powers, are actually developing the technology to disable a satellite without physically destroying it so there is no debris cloud but uh, it is basically the same technology that is uh, required for a, an orbital rendezvous like actually creating a Kessler syndrome could be a strategic choice if you deny my access to space I deny yours so we are even again so to wrap it up the ukraine war has shown that there is an entire new branch an entire new discipline that the ground forces need to take care of and become proficient which is drones and counter drones intelligence and counter intelligence the quiet lower tier is more a matter of developing some relatively accessible technologies when it comes to highest tier and particularly to space-based assets there are potential scenarios that are going to be quite dangerous so i don't have crystal balls but i'll be watching this quite closely so this was a short video just as a reflection about something that actually bothers me about how to break the stalemate and the possible consequences of breaking the stalemate this has a lot to do with the next war because we all hope that is not going to happen but there will be unfortunately a next war however we will soon have another long format video in the meanwhile if you enjoy this video please do the usual youtube stuff subscribe hit the bell uh, like it and so on thank you very much to all those who are supporting the channel on patreon or by being a member you are an absolute star and if you don't support the channel yet if you could consider supporting the channel it would be extremely important because that's what makes uh, all the things that I do possible but also you will have access to the backstage uh, you will have access to uh, additional materials scripts uh, presentations that I do that I use for the videos but also you have access to me if you want to discuss anything if you have questions and so on in the meanwhile thank you very much for watching and see you next time